Greetings, friends. Recently, we received some questions from you all about our life here living in a yurt. Actually, about four pages worth of questions. And we thank you all for submitting your questions. They are really, really good questions. And we also received some questions not related to the yurt living, questions about homeschooling, farm, or animals, and things like that. But we'll address those in another video. In this video, we're just going to address those questions about our life here in a yurt with three kids. Yeah. And just to recap, we have been living here in this yurt for five and a half years now, almost oh, six. Almost six. So almost it's six. kind of hard to believe. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say that. We've been yurt dwellers for almost six years. <laughs> so we used to live in the city. We had a traditional house and, and we lived in a neighborhood. and 1950s but, ranch, yeah. you know. But we got to the point where our desires for our family and for the lifestyle that we wanted to live was we wanted something radically different from what we were living. We wanted to live a life more connected to the land, more connected to one another, and be hands-on with knowing where our food came from and have be participating in that and raise our children in that. And I was like, we need. We were together on this, and we we're like, we need to move and start a homestead. So the yurt provided us a vehicle to be able to have housing to do so. Yes. Yes, it was the most affordable option at the time um, because we bought our house on Craigslist. So that allowed us to be able to make this big leap. And one of the questions that we received was from Holly and Heather, and they both asked about our transition from our traditional house to living in a yurt. What, being, what has been the biggest difference and what has been hard about transitioning to living in a yurt? I think we were so done with living in the city and having dogs barking at us every time we went outside that we were so ready to move. It wasn't like a huge shock because it was quiet out here and that's what we wanted. That was one thing that it what that wasn't a huge shock to us. But um, I guess one of the biggest things in transitioning is, well, for size, for one thing, we had 2,600 square feet in our other house down to 700 square feet. We had already sold a lot of our stuff. Yeah. So it was, it's more of just finding functionality with what you have and, you know, your space in here. I liken it to when you leave your parents, most people leave their parents' house and then they go to college and they stay in the dorm or they stay somewhere they're by themselves. It's a quite, it's, it is a transition and a big change, but it's like you're excited and about the, the new life that you're entering into and you, you really don't want to go backwards, at least most of us don't. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're willing to make the sacrifices yeah. of not having everything maybe not having all the conveniences that you once had because you know you're sacrificing now to have the kind of life that you want to have and someone also asked about the cost of living of purchasing a yurt and ask if it was was expensive to do so and the prices for yurts can range depending on the size of yurt that you want to live in for a brand new one you can pay anywhere from as little as fifteen thousand all the way up to thirty and forty thousand dollars for your yurt, not including some of the other costs for labor and whatever else you may decide to go with as well. That's yeah. a huge cost right there is like your structure that it's mm -hmm. sitting on. So you have to take all that into account. We, we purchased our yurt used, like Lacey said, but um, you can do that as well if there's someone selling one in your area. But um, it can range. You can And you can go as elaborate as you want with a yurt or you can go as simple and as basic as you want like the Mongolians with, with having a dirt floor or something yeah. like that if that's what you yeah. want to go with. So it, it the, the price range, it varies so widely that you know we can't tell you that yeah it's going to be cheaper than one thing than another. It just is like what you can find and what your preferences are. And one of the challenges with adjusting to living in a yurt is dealing with it being circular and not having right angles on it. So Georgetta asks, how do you find the space to make everything fit in our yurt? Cram it in. <laughs> no, not really. Well, you just have to be intentional about what you bring into your house, which I think 
everybody could benefit from. We could have benefited from that living at our other house because if you have the space, you're going to fill it up. And, you know, we limit the kids' toys and wardrobes. And we find that, you know, when we have too much, we need to just go through and get rid of stuff to make sure that we have enough room for the things that we need that we use on a regular basis. And with the curvature of the year, it does force you to put a little bit more forethought into the size of furniture that you're going to bring in because you may want to get something that yeah it looks good but it may not fit no. so you really have to think through extra a little extra about your sizing measuring out and seeing how it will fit if you can actually walk around the furniture that you're thinking yeah. about bringing in so it, it does add a different dynamic as far as that goes with, yeah. with bringing in furniture like right now we would like to get a new couch um, but you know we have to really look at sizes and we would love it to double as like a bed too but uh, we'll see and mainly Manda ask about are what ways of organization works best for us with living in a yurt I'm still figuring that out yeah I think um, I was just thinking the other day of my shelves over there it's just too much stuff and I need to figure out a system that works really good but I, I'm not there yet I keep reorganizing and hoping for the best but we'll see and it's one of those things I would I would think that we would still have some of the similar issues in a traditional house as far as storage space and yeah. and finding ways of organizing I, I think it's a process more than it is a systematic way of doing it yeah and but I there are I would like some other shelving and things like that I just have to figure out a place to put it that is functional and I think we are learning especially being in a society that just consumes 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 yeah. and just bring in bring in I think we are learning to have better habits of being more mindful to the items that we bring in and uh, just getting to the point and trying to help the kids learn this too you can't keep everything no. you have to be more selective on what items you have you're limited on spaces we're not Sometimes we're not limited in our wants and desires, but we're limited in our capacity to be able to handle those wants and desires. Because yeah. there's lots of things that I would love to have for the kitchen, but I don't necessarily use them enough to make a space in my house for them. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Everything is a trade-off. And KJ asked about if we would change the layout that we have for our yurt. And we put a lot of time and forethought yeah. before we set the yurt up of how we wanted the rooms to be divided oh wow and, and i like had this two sheets of paper taped together and i drew it out and i had you know every inch was a square foot and i cut out little pieces uh, that match the size of our couch and refrigerator mm -hmm. and all the square footage and we laid them out in different ways and then you i figured in for well how much does a wall space take and then how much space would we need for like walking beside things and yeah. then it was we rearranged it so many different times. Yeah. I think this layout still works for what we want it to. Exactly right. I would do it a little bit different with the loft. I wouldn't have the loft so high. I would bring it down a little bit. Um, but overall, I'm still happy with the footprint of everything. Yeah, because I had also, well, when we were doing this planning process, I was looking at so many other floor plans of, that people had used for years and I really felt felt like we were comfortable with what and I still feel that we're comfortable with what we have right now yeah oh I do know one thing that I would change I would go back and I would put our yurt on a platform with a deck outside and also I would make like a wash house uh, so it would have our bathroom and washer and dryer and have that connect to the yurt so it wouldn't be inside so we'd have a little bit more like living space but other than that i don't think i would i would change anything i just think that would it, it would help just some issues that we do have and speaking of our layout for the yurt becca asked if we wanted to change any of the layout here for the rooms would we be able to do so yeah you can do that just like any other house it's actually easier to do it in here because all the walls that we put up are non-load bearing. 
So you can take those down and rearrange however however you would want, and yep. you, but you still have like your electrical, you have to relocate and things like that. But um, yeah. Pretty simple. She also asked, is it hard to find alone time? What about alone time? Do Are we able to get alone time while we're here? Well, I think anybody with three children has a hard time finding alone time. But yes, it's possible. We send the kids away to the grandparents for the day or evening or whatever. Or you could just walk right outside like I do from time to time and then you have plenty of time alone or with the chickens or ducks or whatever else you want to do. And I do that or you go in the greenhouse or yeah, it's not that yeah. hard to find alone so time. So there, there's outdoor living too. Yeah. And we have doors on our bedroom and in the bathroom and we can close the doors. If we can close so it's doors. not like an all access <laughs> pass to everybody. Yeah, it's not totally. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't have that here. <laughs> And Hermit Hill Farm asked, how hard is it to keep it clean here? And do we need any special cleaners? <laughs> yes, it is hard to keep it clean because when you have five people in and out all day long, and especially on a farm, mm -hmm. like you know, and you have your muck boots on all the time, and I'm constantly having to remind people, no boots past the door, no boots past the door and uh it, it is dirty but that's just comes along with having three kids and living on a farm it's not because of the yurt no it has trouble no. keeping clean no. it's, it's because, because of us the, the people us. and us being homesteaders and farmers yeah. like if this yurt was almost anywhere else other than a homestead it would be so much easier to keep it clean as far oh, as yeah. the floors and everything because we don't have a lot of space to clean. Yeah. So the only other thing I do is with the lattice work is sometimes it's harder to clean because it's just not a smooth surface. And so you have to pay more attention to that. And Ken ask about us, how do we deal with no outside light, especially during the winter? Well, we actually have a, a dome. A dome right up there. It's kind of like a skylight, but not technically a skylight. No. Uh, so that brings light in. And with the renovations that we are planning to do with bringing the windows in, that'll bring some more natural light in as well. I've been greatly looking forward to that and can't wait till we're done with that. But um, with that, that right now is our only, this and then we have a front door just right outside here that also brings, brings in, in a lot of light. And, and light as well. And our dome is, is covered up. We just have it normally in the winter time, we uncover it and let more light shine in. But I just didn't want to get up there and take the, it's, it's really a sunshade. Because even though our dome is tinted, when the sun just comes straight down in through there, it will heat up in here super fast. So that's why we actually have it covered up and that's to just keep it cooler in here. And earlier we mentioned about having doors in the bedroom and in the bathroom, but Carol asked if someone uses the bathroom, <laughs> it does it number two, does it smell up the whole yurt? <laughs> and the it depends on who does it. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, no, not no, because we have doors and it's we just have like, ventilation in the bathroom. Yes, we have too. ventilation, so we can we can use the exhaust to pump it out uh, if there is a smell <laughs> or when there's a smell. <laughs> yeah, not if, but when. <laughs> uh, but uh, other than that, we there's no there's no smell issues from no. anything bath related. Uh, if the bathroom, if if it was all open here, then yeah, obviously, but want who'd want to do that? <laughs> And the types of questions that we get asked most frequently are about condensation, mold, and weather. The yurt being able to withstand different types of weather that may, we may encounter. And Muggle Munchie asks, will it stand up to severe weather, high winds, severe thunderstorms? Yes, it does. We have had high winds right outside of our door. We've had our greenhouse been flipped up and turned over and everything at least twice yeah at least twice <laughs> <laughs> but our yurt it has been fine and I think a big part of that is it's round mm -hmm. and wind will go straight around it there's nothing for it to get caught on to you know rip things off yeah you think about wind and going against the curvature just kind of kind of blow around it yeah. and that's for the most part that's what happens and here recently since we started doing the renovations on the sides 
uh, putting the plywood on. Before that, we would hear the, the side walls just flapping. Oh, whenever a really strong wind, let's say, you know, 40 mile an hour, 50 mile an hour gust came around with the, the vinyl on the outside and the insulation, it would just <laughs> rattle and vibrate against the lattice work. And uh, it, it, it's a little scary for the kids whenever that happens. But with the plywood, that hasn't, you know, been an issue at all. So. And they also ask about how do we keep it climate controlled in here with heating and cooling? And someone also asked about what is the optimal heating and cooling setup that's worry free? Well, first off, I don't think we have a system that is worry free with our heating and cooling here. One that I desire to go to that I think would be worry free. And we actually know someone else who does live in a yurt, actually two, two families that live in a yurt and have that. And it is a mini ductless system that you can set up and that would take care of your heating and your cooling. As far as our setup here, we have a wood stove as well as, what was it, a year and a half ago now that we added, maybe two years, yeah. that we added uh, central AC um, with, um, what is it, your normal... Yeah, just an AC unit just that we AC have out unit, there yeah. with ducts, with duct work. So uh, we desire to go to the mini duct list, but uh, that's what we have right now. And uh, I was so thankful that we put that in because it has definitely, a lot of people ask about heating it and keeping it cool here. But for us, a big challenge was also keeping it cool during the summer months. But uh, during the winter months, uh, we have temperatures that get down into the teens and the it's, wood stove does a great job yeah, with that yeah. and we've been down to the single digits we don't really go below zero and it's not super common for us to go single digits but we do get down in the 20s and teens fairly often in the winter mm -hmm. and yeah we've stayed warm a lot of people worry about us staying warm enough and with, even with uh, the insulation is very thin but it, it's it holds heat surprisingly well in here a lot of people in the winter they'll come inside and they're like wow it's really warm in here like yeah it is really warm in here mm -hmm. and our first winter before we had the wood stove was such a pain we had these electrical heaters and it was uh, awful it did not keep us warm at all and I don't recommend no. that. Use those to as supplemental heat, but not your main heat. Yeah. So not only were we cold, I'm stepping out of the shower one day and I remember it was just <laughs> steam all over from from <laughs> the heat of the hot water coming in, but cold out there. Then I step out and see the heater reading 40, I think it was 40 degrees, 42, something yeah. like that. And I was just like, oh, this is not fun. This is not fun. Sayla would take a shower with me and we'd be getting out. She's like, it's cold, mommy, it's cold. And I'm like, I know, dry off and get dressed. It's like you want to take a shower, but you don't want to yeah. get out yeah. of the shower once you're in there. Yeah. <laughs> and you, then you don't want your hot water to run out. So you got to be strategic in how you take a shower. Yeah. Yeah, so we were so thankful once we had the wood stove. And on top of that, when we were using the electrical heater, we were dealing with condensation and mold that time. Mold was growing underneath our mattress on the floor or underneath our wardrobe, and we'd have to wash and wash and wash. But once we got the wood stove, it totally eliminated having to deal with any yeah. of the condensation and mold. We've actually had to add moisture back in the air yeah. and put, you know, like a pot of water on the stove because it gets so dry in here. Mm -hmm. But I think if you have a really good, like, ventilation and you can have air move, even with just, like, fans, um, so you have air moving and you have some, some dry air, then you don't have to worry about the mold and mildew. Yeah. And, and we never, we never had that in the summertime, even before we had air conditioning and all the windows were open and everything. We never had mold issues in the summer. It was only in that winter when we were just using that electric heat and it wasn't warm enough in here to, um, to just take that moisture away. And other people who we know who've lived in yurts and they have dealt with that problem, it was because they didn't have a good flow of air or something to dry out yeah. the moisture in their home. Yeah. And, but you could have that same problem in a traditional house as yeah. well. We actually cut a hole in the wall over by the wood stove so we would have airflow into our bedroom and keep that mold from growing in there. 
And we also had a number of questions of people who live in really cold areas asking if yurts could hold up there. And actually a lot of the yurts that you'll see in, in ads and in uh, other places, their temperatures are much yeah. colder than what we have to in, deal in with. In the mountains of Colorado, in Alaska, they're dealing with large snow loads. Um, there's people in Canada. Uh, that live in the in, in a yurt in the upper peninsula, you know that there's lots of people in very cold areas that live in yurts yeah. So I think um, you know as long as you're prepared Then you'll be fine. Yeah, I think even in Colorado They have Airbnb yurts for people to stay in yeah. while they're skiing and doing yeah. di doing different things I think ma ma the main problem would be in areas that are really really hot mm -hmm. and humid Just being mindful of you're gonna need to have something to kind of control that air and moisture yeah. in the air or move the air you know making sure you have good air movement through the yurt if you don't have air conditioning and mainly manda asked about rainy day being loud in here when it rains and we actually did a video on that so we encourage you to check that out but uh when the rain comes you do hear it uh, definitely puts us more connected with when the rain comes through, shower comes through. And it just through. depends on what you're doing. Like this morning it was actually raining and I didn't want to get out of bed. I just wanted to lay there and listen to it rain. But you know, if it's really pouring and you're on the phone, that's not a good time. Or you want to watch TV or yeah. talk or yeah. something, then you kind of have to yell. Yeah. But um, I love actually hearing the rain on the roof. It's yeah. annoying sometimes, but for the majority of the time, I love it. And we've had a lot of rain here recently. And, yeah. and the soft rain and even the medium rains are, are not bad. It's kind of soothing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but when the rain, hard rain comes, it can be an inconvenience, like yeah. Lacey said, depending on what you're doing, if you're conversation or it's trying like, to watch something. It's like, hey! Why? <laughs> so that can be, be interesting. But that doesn't happen all the time. And for those of you who don't know, we've been doing renovations here on our yurt here recently. I kind of hinted at it earlier. But Diane Williams asked, in related relation to our renovations, do we plan to use a cool, dark storage under our yurt, like a root cellar, for growing things like mushrooms, things like that? Uh, I'm going to say no. I don't plan on storing any anything food-wise under the yurt. Uh, I don't feel like that would be a good idea for what we want to do. I'm not opposed to a root cellar, but I don't want it to be right under us in our house. Uh, we do have a couple areas on the property, one main area that, that could serve for setting up a, um, a root cellar, but uh, I, I wouldn't want a root cellar under the house. I don't no, know about you. No, not right, no. I also think that trying to store or grow mushrooms under the house could invite mold into that area and, and that's one place i definitely don't want we don't want a mold. high moisture content no. under our house no uh victoria bryce also asked that same question but she also asked a number of really good questions and uh she asked are we going to put siding on the earth yes we are that is what we're in the process of trying to figure out exactly what we want to put on the side and um what's going to be most effective for us and she also asked if we basically had unlimited budget and we were to do any kind of setup that we wanted to do for a year, yeah. what would we do? Would we go with one massive one, stacking it on top, kids' three bedrooms? What would we do? An unlimited budget? <laughs> well, yeah, no restrictions on that. Wow. That's, that's kind of like... That's... <laughs> I don't... Oh, wow. I've never a quadruple had... decker year. <laughs> I've never had that to even think it's about. It's a great question. I tell you, she had it a good question. It is a really great question. So I think like what I had talked about, about having what I would change with what we have now and having almost like a, a bathhouse, I think I would probably still have that and have like massive decks maybe around two, two yurts. I mean, we don't need a ton of space, no. but... I think two 30 footers or even like if we had 35 footers and you know having one for the main living space kitchen area that type of thing I could have a nice pantry and things like that and then having another one just for you know bedrooms yeah I, I think that would serve us really well and that's the direction that we yeah. want to go in but if you're saying no restriction no yeah. i would say i want it now yeah <laughs> pay somebody oh, and, to get it done okay. now <laughs> and have one of those have have one of those be 
like one of the yurts from uh, the Blue Ridge Yurt Company that has the 10 foot sidewalls. Yeah. So you could have 10 feet sidewalls. Yeah, that'd be cool. And it's enough that, um, you know, maybe over your kitchen, you could have your office, your office space or something. So you would have just extra space if you needed to like work from home, like what we do. Yeah. <laughs> it would be nice to have that <laughs> dedicated space. So those are some of the things that we're considering doing. She also asked, have we ever watched Living Off Grid with Jake and Nicole? And yes, we have seen theirs. So it's pretty neat thing, some of the things yeah. that they're doing up there and i think i believe it's pretty cool where they are as they're well. in canada so yeah yeah so they're living in the earth it's pretty off grid pretty cool. yeah out way out in the woods i think so mm -hmm. yeah and continuing on with our future plans and renovations that we have here somebody asked if we plan to paint our yurt doors um <laughs> Yes, I would. Answer is I would yes like and to. no. Well, he wants a bigger door, which yeah. I can, I agree. I, I These are French yeah. doors, which I really don't like. Well, but they're two small French doors. Yeah. And what he wants to do is make it a normal size width of a door. It's not going to be the normal height because our limitations with our sidewall. Uh, but I... We, we do want to paint them, and I know they look terrible. <laughs> we, we don't need to be told. We, we see them every day. But, yeah. And continuing on with our plans and, and desires for the future, um, people ask, can you add on to the yurt? Um, Easter Roberts asked, do y'all ever plan to add to the yurt? And the answer is yes, we yes. do. Uh, I have this desire, and I think Lacey does too, is we want to add another yurt. Now, somebody's asked before, uh, can you connect them? And, and yes, you can yes. connect yurts. And uh, we want to do so. We want to have this yurt that we're in now eventually be more like just our bedroom areas, living quarters, and then have a separate yurt that would be mainly just like uh, for kitchen and just kind of do the kitchen that we want to like do. Like what I talked about, if we had an unlimited budget. Yeah. That That's what we're kind of going for. One dedicated living space and one dedicated sleeping space. We just don't have that unlimited budget. Yeah. I do want to mention that there. It is, like I said, it is limited. that has never, <laughs> never been an option, an unlimited budget. But it's there. we'll take an unlimited one. <laughs> if someone wants to hook us up with an unlimited budget, we're not going to say no. <laughs> and continuing on with that, other a couple of people have asked, like uh, Tina, uh, with Sailor getting older, will she be able to have a room to herself at some point? And that would fit within the plans that we have here. Uh, currently our bedroom is back behind that wall right there. <laughs> and we want to move our bedroom into the living area once we have uh, this, another the, living the, space. The additional yurt. And then Sayla could take our bed our bedroom and that would be hers. So that yeah. would solve that. And but I also want to say that you don't always need your own bedroom. No. And a lot of people think this, that kids need their own bedroom. I shared a bedroom with my brother until I was 17. And I think I turned out okay. Um, you just learn to live with somebody yeah. and you're just sleeping in your bedroom. Like yeah. I never spent a ton of time in my bedroom yeah. other than sleeping or laying on my bed reading a book. So. I, I think that's just kind of the mindset of our society as, as the families have gotten smaller and the houses have gotten bigger we just have this idea that we need more space you need more space you need more space and that's not actually yeah. true because the families back in the day were smaller or i mean bigger with smaller houses so. a one room house yeah, i mean a little house on the prairie yeah come on now no. <laughs> but uh yeah i think is the main thing is is you have your own private area like a bathroom to go to but yeah. other than that so yeah yeah so it's not an open air bathroom yeah <laughs> And Anna asked about, would we give Sayla her own mini year? <laughs> That's actually kind of a cool idea. Well, actually, I've, I've seen some people that they had, you know, they're teenagers. They made them like a shed to house conversion for their own bedroom. And I think once they get to a certain age, that's a great idea yeah. because then they're transitioning to have their own space. You know, they're going to transition out of living under our roof to going out into the world and having their own space. And I think that is a really good option once that, you know, they're at a certain age and, you know, yeah. it's just a preparing <clears throat> them to move on. Then we got one question that I had to work on not being defended by. They ask if 
we plan to move into a house. It's like, hello, I, I live in a yeah, house. It's we, just we not your house. traditional house. But I, I think I know the heart behind the yeah. question. Do we ultimately plan to live in a, a, a more traditional house? And at some point, um, I think for the main thing is living the type of lifestyle that we want to live and the house is just a, a, a thing to help us yeah. to, uh, to to live that kind of lifestyle. Uh, I, I would like to keep here and maybe have it as an option for the kids to live in and still use it as a farm and then maybe purchase some land around here and then we build more of like our forever home is which I think yeah. you're, you're referring to. But we'll just see where things go. Um, like I said, the main thing is uh, there's certain things that I want for our family to be and to do, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. And have I thought about building another house? Yes, but I would like it to be on, you know, property that we find that, like Mike said, could be our forever home. And a number of people have asked, do we plan on having any more children? <laughs> I love being a parent and I would greatly welcome more children and to our family, but we'll just have to see where things go. <laughs> He's not the one that has to have them. So, I'm not saying no, but, hmm. But I do say, and, and I wanna continue to relay this in the videos that we do, that I feel that this is one of my most important times of life of passing things on to another generation with our kids and I hope that we inspire and encourage you in some way to do the same because I love being a father I love being a parent I think it is a huge blessing and calling that I am very honored to, to have and speaking of families the rusty spigot asked we are a large family ten children only six at home now but that's still a good bit yeah, it is. I looked in the yurts, but they are so expensive. Do you have any homestead housing suggestions for a large family? Uh, yes, I do. Yurts can be expensive, as we mentioned earlier, but you can look around and you still may be able to find an option for you. Now, depending on your budget, which sounds like budget is a concern, I would look at finding maybe some, some homesteads or old farms that uh, maybe in foreclosure or, or something like that where they're really trying to get rid of them or um, And don't rule out a yurt because you're looking at a brand new one mm -hmm. You know keep your eye out on Craigslist or Facebook marketplace or things like that because you never know when one of those might turn up um, but also you know there are shed to house conversions like um, Better Together Life, they have a YouTube channel um, that's all about their shed to house conversion and I, I, don't, I can't remember how many kids they have. But I also have some friends, they just built a tiny home and they have eight kids. So maybe we can go interview them one day and yeah. show you their new house. They just moved in the other day and they were actually living in a schoolie for like the past three or four years. Yeah. So, you know, maybe we can, you know, go talk to them and give you some more ideas. Yeah, and uh, look out for used yurts like, like we did. And we also know someone who got the same size yurt that we had, even cheaper, I think yeah. half the price. Yeah, so. it was Beverly and Shane that we did that whole video on not long ago. I'll link it so you can take a look at it. And the last question for this video is from Janet Becker. Have you ever looked into camping yurts so a single person like myself could have the opportunity to experience the life I have only dreamed of. Yes, we have. Uh, it's like a future goal if, if, say, the kids didn't want to live here anymore and we've moved on. We thought about using this as an opportunity to do like an Airbnb or something like that or if we purchase more property to have one where somebody could do that. But I also am planning to go do a video on a place that just opened not too far from here called Amber Glow Resorts. And they have multiple types of tiny, small, alternative housing that people can come stay in and get the experience to learn what it's like. They have yurts, they have tiny homes, they have these pod thingies. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's in the Lake Lure area of North Carolina. So we'll give you more information on that, but just to give you an idea of where it is. And there are actually some national parks, some state parks 
that have yurts set up exactly right. that um, you can go stay in. Yeah, but we'll also uh, put the link below for Ember Glow Resorts and make sure you stay tuned for that video. And if you haven't already, click that subscribe button right there and also sign up to receive notifications each time we release a video. Well, that's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed our Q&A about our yurt living and uh, make sure you stay tuned because uh, we're gonna be doing some more renovations here and the growing season is cranking up mm -hmm. big time. Well, that's it for now. We'll see you next time. As always, grow on, be strong, and live life without excuses. And thanks for all the questions. We'll see you later. Bye. <clears throat>